Good morning. It is a privilege to be here with you on your homecoming. That's a big deal, and this is a big crowd. And I know you're ready for me to sit down so we can go eat mac and cheese, so I won't keep you too long. But I do want to celebrate this wonderful day. I loved hearing the history, some of the history. Did you hear who built the building? Mr. Angel. (laughs) Come on. That's cool. I loved hearing those names, and I am curious about where those first log buildings were built and where those pews made out of those contributed tree logs are now. I'm fascinated by this. As a missionary kid, um, when we all graduated from high school in Kenya, we all went to all different parts of the world, so it's really hard for me to get to go to a homecoming as somebody who's lived Lots of different places. I don't really know where to go home, so I'm glad to be a part of yours. Are there people that have come from other places that are here today? Are most of you home? Okay, I see some hands. So welcome back. It makes me wonder what home actually really is. So I've been thinking about that as I've prepared to come see you this morning. Home is not defined by wealth. It's where our heart is. It might be more about a person than a place or a gathering of people like this one. If there's something global that we all share, no matter the race or income or religion or belief, it is that we all want a place to call home. We know where we were born, where we went to high school, and where we were baptized, possibly in this place. Maybe it's the first time you saw your child or held your grandchild, or maybe it's inside the arms of someone that you love more than words can say. Maybe that defines home for you. Home is a place where you feel comfortable to, sh- to cook breakfast in in your pajamas. These are quotes I found about people that were describing home on the Internet. And then some people have to leave perfectly good homes Perfectly good homes that they love, colonies of people because of religious persecution or because of war or famine, never to return, forever longing to see those mountains and sit under the trees that they remember as home, which is why it's so important that Mel gets to go to Greece and help those refugees find new homes and why it's so important for you to go to Rio Grande Valley and help people discover a way to find home again. Because that's what Jesus would be doing, right? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will help you find a resting place. And for 166 years, this has been a resting place to welcome people in and find home. I, I am curious about where the... Ohachi number one is? (laughs) Y'all are Ohachi number two? Under where Ohachi number one is? Curious. So this morning we're going to read from Luke chapter four, and I gave Chris the wrong um, uh, verse. It's going to be 14 through 20 in a minute, and we're going to read that together. Chris, thank you for inviting me to this place and for your leadership for the last five years here, four, four, getting ahead of myself. Um, You are well known beyond the boundaries of Jacksonville and for the good work that you're doing um, in Haiti and at the border of Texas and in Perry County. And it is my honor to be welcomed home today. Will you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. May we feel your presence continue as we already have through worship of song and the beauty of the creation that children bring to worship. Thank you that you are here <clears throat> with us and that you have something to say after all these years to celebrate what has been and to dream about what will be in the future, because we pray expectantly in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You'll have to forgive me. I'm getting over a cold, so I sound a little <clears throat> this morning. Jesus, in the fourth chapter of Luke, is going home. In verse 14, it says, Jesus returned to Gal Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. And he went home to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, and as was his custom, he stood up to read. And they passed him a scroll, and he opened it to the book of Isaiah, and he read those words, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, and he looked at the crowd, and all the eyes were fastened on him. And he said, today, this prophecy has become true in your midst. Do you remember what happened? The crowd got mad. They got angry at him. And Jesus said, oh, perhaps you want me to do what I did in Capernaum. And I was like, what happened in Capernaum? So I had to go backwards and look over in the book of Mark. So Jesus, right before he went home, had been tested 40 days in the wilderness. It was at the beginning of his ministry, and he had just spent 40 days, no water, no food, being tested in the wilderness. And he is coming home, and before he gets home, he passes through the town of Capernaum. And just like he did everywhere else, he stopped into the synagogue, to the Sabbath school. And they handed him a scroll, and he opened the, Bible, the scroll, and he read. And as he was reading, this guy walks in from the back, and he says, Jesus of Nazareth, what do you want with us? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are God's holy one. People were like, well, you know, wait on, hang up, hang on. He interrupted Jesus while Jesus was reading, and he's yelling at him. But Jesus called him out, not really to the physicality of the man, but to the demon inside of him, the darkness inside of him. And it, and it brought him peace. It calmed him down. A miracle happened, and the crowd was surprised and amazed because they witnessed the power of God in that man's life that day, right? Then Jesus leaves Capernaum and he goes home to Nazareth. It's where he had grown up as Joseph and Mary's son. And I'm sure he ate his mama Mary's familiar food. He'd missed it. He probably waved at the shopkeepers that had seen him grow up his whole life. Oh, there's Joseph's kid. You know they say that about you when you're walking around here. They all know whose kids you are, even if you think you're invisible. It's part of being a part of a neighborhood. And he goes to the synagogue, as I just read, and he reads from Isaiah. And they got mad. Well, at first, they thought it was kind of interesting. They, they spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words. But then somebody kind of in a record scratch kind of moment, you know how when you're watching a cartoon and it goes, Rrr! somebody said, hey, wait a minute, isn't that Joseph's son? And then Jesus said, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. You want me to do what I did in Capernaum, don't you? You want me to do some sort of miracle or magic trick so that you actually do believe that I am the one that I say that I am. Well, this was really mad, and they rose up, and they tried to drive him out of town and throw him off the cliff. But Jesus walked through the crowd and went on his way. So why am I telling these two stories this morning? Jesus went to two synagogues in two different towns. He read from the scroll in both synagogues. The crowds in one synagogue was, was amazed. The crowds in the other synagogue was amazed. 
But the difference is, in Capernaum, they actually recognized Jesus as God's holy one. Not just Joseph and Mary's son, but the actual holy one of God. So my question for you, First Baptist Williams, is how do you hear those words from Jesus this morning, those words from Isaiah? Those were the first words, recorded words, from his ministry. That's what he chose to say after he left the wilderness and said, this is why I'm here. I am here to fulfill this prophecy. How do you hear that? Are you listening with the ears of the hometown crowd, or are you listening with the ears of those from, Naz- from Capernaum? The Nazareth crowd thinks Jesus is a really great guy. They like to celebrate him. He, said, he did some really neat stuff. He grew up to be quite a rock star. Let's just talk about him, sing about him, and then let's go have lunch after church. I have no problem with having lunch after church. <laughs> or do you really believe that Jesus is God's holy one, capable of miracles in the world through God's people? Some churches are stuck in Nazareth, and some are actually following the Son of God. Be careful how you answer that, because One takes a lot more work than the other one. I believe, no, I know, that First Baptist Williams are people who understand who Jesus Christ is and the power of him in in your life and the grace that has brought you for 166 years to today, the amazing grace So I want to say that those words were not just words for the people of Nazareth or Capernaum that Jesus read from the scroll. Those words are for you today as followers of Jesus Christ. I want you to hear them again as though Jesus were saying them to this crowd this morning. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you. God has anointed you, has, is, and will anoint you to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to sit with them on the Texas border in Perry County and in Greece as they stream into the country looking for life. That's who this church is about. It's who you have been. It is who you will continue to be. Preach the good news. Proclaim favor and freedom and recovery, not just because God, Jesus said to do so, but because by doing so cooperatively with your church and my church and their church, we are able to export that love of Christ to corners of the world through financial, thoughtful, and prayerful support so that other little crowds along the way have the opportunity to, to encounter Christ and harness the power of the Holy One in their own lives. For those of you who have supported cooperative missions forever, you put me under a tree in Africa. And that's where I learned about God's love, singing next to folks that I didn't always understand their language, but I could tell they knew the power of the Holy One in their life by the way they sang, by what we did as a church community together. It is important to see the global church and recognize our part in it as harnessers of this power of Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending your children to kids camp and to Passport Youth Camp because we have conversations about Bali and Malawi and Texas and Kenya and India. And we learn about what this power is doing around the world. Um, I was a part of a passport Liberia a few years ago. If you know anything about Liberia, when we finally set the slaves free in the south, many of them got on a boat and went back to Liberia. And the civil war that has been affecting that country for decades is between freed slaves in America and the people who actually have lived in Liberia before the slaves came back. 
So we're doing camp with these children who've known nothing but war, have been fragmented by that. And I'm there just with my video camera and my photograph, my camera, just documenting the, the camp. And it's amazing. They, <clears throat> the choir director, he sings that they don't have hymnals and they don't have PowerPoint. And so he sings, um, a, a, he would sing a line and then the crowd would sing back with him, call and response. And sometimes I would just let the recorder play in the darkness to catch the sound of these hymns that they took back with them. They're singing these hymns, Grace Greater Than All Our Sins and, and Amazing Grace. They're, they're singing in Liberia. Some of the children that lived at the boarding school where we were having camp were too little. They weren't old enough to go to camp yet, and so they would follow me around. And they would help me carry my camera, and we would giggle and have snacks, and I showed them peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and um, they were really cute, invited me into their home. So I made friends with them. We were there on the last night of worship, and it was dark. There's no, gen generator only allows for like just a little bit of sound, but not much light, and I was letting the camera roll um, while they were singing these songs. And in the middle of a prayer, I heard this scream come from outside. I was like, what is happening out there? And I looked around to see if anybody was going to go check on this blood-curdling scream, and nobody could. Everybody was working. Everybody's doing their part in the service. And so I stood up to go outside into the darkness, and I knew immediately where the scream was coming from. It's coming from this little child. There was an apartment below where we were having worship, like it would be underneath this building. So I went to the door, and it was the children that had been following me around all week. And I knocked on the door, and they opened the door. I said, who's crying? They said, Mariah. I said, why is Mariah crying? <laughs> and the, and the um, sister said, well, because Stephen shoved her. Does that sound familiar to anybody? I looked around the room. Papa was nowhere. His door was locked. There was no mom. She had deserted them. There were no toys to pick up. There was no me movie to watch, no TV to turn off, no colors or teddy bears. Just a concrete table, a light bulb, and a 12-year-old doing her best to mother three younger siblings. Mariah appeared, the one that was crying. She had a cloth tied about her for pajamas, tears streaming down her cheeks. So I walked in and I sat down on the floor. The three smallest lay across me like I was a blanket in the sunshine. And I straightened my legs to create a little more lap space. What in the world was I supposed to do, good shepherd? Holy one of God, what do we do when the world is crying at our feet? Let's see, what did Jesus do when the disciples would grumble and complain? He told stories. That's one of my favorite things about Jesus. So I decided to tell a story. Would you like to hear a story? And you would have thought I had just turned on the Disney Channel. And I told the first story that came to my head. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. And the oldest child sitting in a chair across from me, she kind of looked at me like, I know that story. It's in the library. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. I told the story with as, many, with as much excitement and animation as I could come up with just to entertain everybody and get their mind off of whatever it was they were fighting about. I huffed and I puffed, and the wolf died at the end, or whatever the wolf does in your three little pigs story. The houses fell, the, pig ran, the pigs ran, and I was making this up on the fly when the words of providence, when the words of the Holy One, when the words of Jesus my Savior kicked in. And I said, sometimes when the big sister and the, when the little brother and sister fought, the big sister would put one in one chair and one in another chair. <laughs> and then they wouldn't fight anymore. The oldest sister was like, that is not in the story. <laughs> the pigs live even with no parents around. The big bad wolf was gone. Smiles replaced tears. But now what, God? Sitting in the semi-darkness, 
the story was over. I couldn't come back the next night because I was going to be gone. I can't just tuck them in the bed and kiss them on the head and pretend like everything's going to be okay. It's bad enough if you're sad. It is unbearable when there's four little sets of eyes staring back at you and you don't know what to do. But then I was not alone. John, the worship leader upstairs, began to sing. The services were just about over, hope shining in the darkness, and I knew what to do. I started singing with the choir above me. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, what? It is well with my soul. And John sang, it is well. So we sang, it is well with my soul, with my soul. And then we all sang together, it is well, it is well with my soul. First Baptist Williams, if you truly believe that Jesus is the Holy One that we all claim that he is, that he's not just the son of a carpenter, then hear the good news this homecoming Sunday. You are surrounded by a choir, a choir that's 166 years before you and will be 166 years after you. You are surrounded by a choir of people who are glad that you are here for sure. But the only reason we are all here is that we have known home in Jesus Christ. The miracle that can happen in each of our lives is that Jesus loves us so much, boys and girls, that he's always with us. We just have to invite him to be. And then we're never alone, and we're always home. Because wherever we go, he'll be there too. So welcome home, and be well. Amen.